Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my real pleasure to be here in this DCO fantastic program. And uh, uh, for me, this one of the main outcome of the DCO program is, uh, is within this, this room, that is uh, young people that made networking, that created a new communities that will last for long. So bravo for DCO. Okay. Um, just uh, let me say that, uh, in fact, uh, what I'm going to present is a group effort, of course, with people from Nancy, but people also worldwide. And uh, you have also an idea of the sponsor on, on, on the right-hand side. And let's start. I have 10 minutes to build the solar system and the Earth, so we have to hurry up a little bit. So it started, as you know, when a, a fraction of, um, of a molecular cloud uh, collapsed, gave rise to a central star surrounded by a disk of gas and dust. And um, schematically, it would be like this. You have the, the protostar, the protosun, making uh, nuclear reactions, surrounded by a disk of gas and dust. Uh, the dust is uh, coalescing uh, by electric force and then by impact, makes uh, planetesimal planets, the gas dissipates, and we obtain the present day solar system with the inner planets, Earth is here, asteroids, giant planets, and here you still have some small bodies that, is, uh, that formed ultimately the, the uh, belt of, uh, of comets, okay? So um, where is carbon over there? Carbon was in the gas as a CO, it, uh, it was the, the main host of carbon in the nebula. And uh, carbon now uh, can be found in primitive meteorites that formed 4.56 billion years ago that have kept a memory of that. And uh, in uh, primitive meteorites, it's mostly in the form of organics by far in terms of, uh, of content. You have other phases that are very much interested, but most of the carbon is organic in meteorites. And it's possible to understand, or it may, at least to make a model of how carbon was trapped in this material because you have some gas, the gas is uh, H2, helium of course, uh, nitrogen, CO, and if you add some, uh, some energy to this, like uh, photons from the young sun or from nearby stars, you start to ionize and you start to make uh, organics, a solid material from this. And this can be reproduced in the lab, we've been working for, for some time on this. So, in the lab, you take some gas mixture at low pressure, you ionize them with a plasma, and you obtain some tar, sorry. You obtain uh, some, uh, some, oops, some tar here, and uh, you make organics, which resemble quite well to uh, refractory organics you can find in meteorites, uh, in terms of Raman spectra, in terms of uh, fractionation of noble gas that are trapped here, and uh, in terms also on the, on the, on the structure. Okay, so it works pretty well, and then you get some organics uh, that are trapped. Then you can model all these organics are dispersed in the, in, in, in the, in the solar, nascent solar system. So this is a disk, and uh, after some time, they tend to sediment on the, on, 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 on the equatorial plane, and here it can be trapped by, uh, by uh, uh, growing metal, silicated metal, okay? However, we have heard this morning that, in fact, uh, the distribution may not be homogeneous because uh, you have a gradient of energy, gradient of entropy in the disk. And it, at some stage, you, you, you have some ice that cannot condense too close to the sun, but also you cannot keep all the, the organics you have been creating for long. This means that it's possible that uh, the Earth grew up quite uh, dry or quite carbon depleted. And uh, this is an estimate from uh, DCO, that is uh, about uh, the Earth's carbon pool. It is about uh, less than 0.05% uh, carbon. So coming back to, the, the, to, to, to this scheme, it's possible that the Earth grew quite carbon poor uh, at this stage here, and then some uh, carbon-rich bodies were later on uh, uh, added. It, it's just a model, it's not certain, but it's a possibility. Another possibility is, uh, could be comets. And people who are modeling the, the birth of the solar system uh, believe or suspect that there has been some uh, a swinging of giant planets at some stage that disturbed completely uh, the asteroid belt and the cometary disk 
And so you have some uh, bodies from those reservoirs that were scattered all along the disk, including coming to the inner part of the solar system. This means that, a priori, you cannot really decipher from modeling, at least, if the carbon is a local origin or it's coming from uh, the outer solar system. And that's where the isotopes are coming. So uh, these are the d over h ratio variation in the solar system, so it's huge. Here, this was the protosolar nebula value that was um, inferred from the Jupiter atmosphere and from the solar composition. And uh, in fact, we could do the same for carbon, but the problem for carbon is that uh, you don't have such large variation. Uh, this is a comparison of the isotope variation of carbon with that of the d over h ratio, so it's uh, one, at least one order of magnitude less. So what we are doing, we are using uh, another system, which is nitrogen, and that's come to very interesting mission about this. One is the Genesis mission, and the other one is the Rosetta mission. So the Genesis mission was uh, 15 years ago, and it has been sampling some uh, solar wind uh, ions coming back to Earth and analyzing stable isotopes of oxygen and carbon. And then, in terms of carbon isotope composition, again, we have this type of diagram, which is a huge variation everywhere. It didn't seem there are some logic here, but now with the Genesis data, we know that the solar composition is somewhere here, and the sun is the best representative we have for the protosolar nebula, because it has concentrated all the, the material, almost all the material we have in the solar system. And now you can put together these two uh, type of traces, so you uh, uh, like the d over h ratio and the nitrogen isotope composition. And if you do so, some logic starts to emerge. It seems that you have at least three reservoirs distinct, or maybe continuous, but uh, three reservoirs. One is the inner, is a, sorry, is the starting composition of the protosolar nebula, represented by Jupiter and the Sun. Then you have something that is intermediate, which is the inner solar system, represented by the Earth and by the meteorites, and then you have the comets, which are enriched uh, in nitrogen-15 and deuterium with respect to the other two reservoirs. So, we don't understand very well. There are several possibilities for explaining these uh, large isotope uh, variations, but they can already be used in terms of tools to decipher the origin of uh, terrestrial volatiles, and uh, it seems that at least for nitrogen and uh, hydrogen, water, say water, a local origin is more, uh, is, is favored on this basis. But we can go a step further, and there has been the, this uh, Rosetta mission that was a European Space Agency mission with a NASA participation that, was, uh, that took uh, 10 years to reach, uh, the, um, to, to reach a comet, 67P P Shuryumov Gerasimenko, from the name of people who, the two scientists who discovered it. And on this spacecraft, it stayed uh, more than two years around the comet, and on this spacecraft you had a bunch of instruments, including here a mass spectrometer, high-resolution uh, high mass spectrometer, um, in a group led by Catherine Alveg from the University of Bern, it was an international group, and uh, in fact this mass spectrometer, you don't need uh, any vacuum system here, it just sn sniff out directly the gas that are expelled by the comet, which, pro uh, which are coming from the sublimation of uh, cometary ice. And uh, the analysis uh, clearly showed that, in fact, the comet is not atypical. It's rich in nitrogen-15, it's rich in deuterium, and so it doesn't, it means that you cannot, it confirms that it's difficult to make the ocean carbon and, uh, and, and nitrogen from some outer solar system material. But there was further uh, analysis and some uh, key element, trace element, gave another view about the contribution to, to the Earth. And in this case, this is noble gases, so they are chemically inert, uh, they, uh, they are physical traces, they react to phase change and, 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 and to radioactive and to nuclear processing. And one particularly interesting uh, noble gas is uh, the heaviest stable noble gas, which is xenon, and in fact xenon is uh, like every, every, every element in the solar system is a mixture of everything that has been produced before by, uh, by stars, a previous generation of stars. It has uh, nine isotopes. Some of them are produced by P process, as slow neutron process and rapid neutron process here. Sorry. Uh, okay. 
Now, there was a problem for very long, in fact, uh, um, for uh, terrestrial xenon. And the problem is that the atmosphere contains some xenon that is different for whatever you can find in any other place of the solar system. Uh, it's, it, it is different for two reasons. One, it's mass fractionated, uh, mass dependent fractionated, but this is secondary. This took place during uh, atmospheric escapes during Earth's history. But more interestingly also, once you correct for this, so it's, uh, you correct for mass dependence, you obtain a xenon isotope composition, here normalized to solar or meteoritic, it's about the same at this stage. You obtain a composition that looks like primitive uh, inner solar system for most isotopes, but which is depleted in the two uh, uh, heavier isotopes, 134 and 136, which are uh, air process isotopes producing in, in, in neutron stars, okay? So this has been long for three decades and nobody really had a, a clue on this, but thanks to the analysis of xenon in the comet, now we, we start to see something. So these are the xenon data. It's, um, it's a very difficult measurement. The spacecraft stayed uh, three weeks, very close to the comet at about 10 kilometers. The flight engineers were very nervous about this. They don't like to have a spacecraft uh, circling uh, in the dust emitted by a comet, but anyway. And, and so uh, uh, the error bar are quite large. Uh, it's, 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 in the lab, you can uh, obtain orders of magnitude better precision. Uh, the light isotopes are, well, could not be measured because they are not abundant enough. But there are two interesting features. One is that it's also, uh, the comet is also depleted in the heavy isotope of, of xenon, 134 and 136, okay? Here there is an excess of 129 xenon, but this is a radioactivity, so. But the other isotopes are more or less compatible with a kind of solar composition or meteoritic. And the bottom line is that this depletion of uh, EV uh, isotope of xenon is a kind of fingerprint of uh, cometary contribution to the Earth. And you can make a very simple exercise. Uh, you, can, you can do it with an Excel file. Uh, you mix up some uh, meteoritic xenon. We have some evidence that uh, inside the Earth, uh, noble gas, krypton, xenon are from meteorites. Uh, you, you don't see this depletion. So you mix up some meteoritic xenon with cometary xenon, and you obtain a very good fit uh, for the atmospheric, primitive atmospheric xenon, okay? And the mixing proportion is that you have 20% about of, uh, of uh, cometary xenon in the, in the terrestrial atmosphere, the rest being chondritic. So, uh, at last, now we have uh, some fingerprints of uh, cometary contribution, so we can see what would be the impact on the other volatile. I told you that norm normally from isotopes, water is not from, um, is unlikely to be from comets. And this is confirmed, this is just a mixing, uh, again, a, a, a mixing exercise. This is a fraction of uh, cometary xenon here, and you can obtain with, a, it's a little bit model dependent, but you can obtain the fraction of cometary water, and again, the fraction is probably very minimal, lower than 1% of terrestrial water should come from a comet, as long as uh, 67 picomet represents a cometary reservoir. Okay, so, but an interesting thing is that you, you, you can do also this mixing um, equation, um, or a mass balance approach for organics. And in fact, comets are very rich in organics, the, the classical model of uh, cometary grain is uh, one third organics, one third uh, ice, and one third uh, silicate and metal. And if you do this uh, mixing, you obtain something that is different. You obtain um, an amount of organics that could have been potentially delivered by the amount of comet you need for uh, impacting, for, uh, impacting uh, xenon and, and krypton the same. So from the 20% uh, concentration of, uh, of xenon, you can compute what is the mass of comet and you can compute how much organics. And you end up with a, 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 an abundance of organics that is quite large. And this event is a, could be one order of magnitude higher than biosphere. So it doesn't, doesn't mean that all these organics will survive uh, the, the bombardment, the high energy, but it leaves the possibility that you have a, uh, a, a, a contribution of comets that could have bring some, uh, some uh, organics. Okay, so I'm almost uh, done. Uh, this is just a summary of the delivery of carbon to us. So you start uh, 
six billion years ago, there was still some gas. The, the Earth was growing up. There is a little bit of solar gas in the Earth, solar neon. But most of the volatiles were probably uh, uh, carried out by uh, what is called wet accretion, accretion of bodies that already contain volatiles, including water and, and carbon. You have uh, the moon forming impacts that dried up uh, everything, not everything, which might have removed some volatiles. And after that, uh, after this catastrophic event, the things becomes quite uh, quiet, and uh, you probably have some late addition where the cometary addition would could take place because we don't see it in a, we don't see it in the mantle, and so on. And then we have some evidence of volatile di direct evidence. So I am I, I would like just to to end up with this. Uh, it's a very exciting time now because there are two missions that are going to 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 return some uh, material to us uh, next year and in three years. One is JAXA, a Japanese agency mission. And the other one is OSIRIS-REx, it's a NASA mission, and both are sampling a carbon-rich asteroid. So soon we will have some fresh material, not altered by, by uh, its transfer to Earth and its residence on Earth, that will permit to, to really get some good insight into, uh, into uh, carbon, primitive carbon. That's it, thank you very much. <laughs> has a question for Bernard, would they like to shout it out or come to a microphone? So Bernard, I have a question, quickly. We saw um, Liz Cottrell talk about how carbon in a silicate system will behave a little bit like an incompatible trace element, and Mark Hirschman introduced carbon in a, a metal-rich system applicable to sort of asteroids. Mm -hmm. So do you think we need to try and marry some of the volatile-rich systems you're looking at isotopically with the behavior in these planetesimals to get closer for carbon specifically, because carbon is in all of these places. Yeah, I mean, carbon was probably very reduced. The primitive, uh, primitive organics are reducing. Now it's a behavior, it's dependent on the behavior of other elements like iron and so on. So uh, organics pro might have played a role for the FO2 of mm -hmm. the Earth, but not only, car not only organics. So that's something, an area of research that needs to be explored. Okay. <clears throat> okay, Thank well, you. 